Uh, I'm here with Mark Schaefer. He's an educator, a consultant, and best-selling author of five marketing books, including Social Media Explained and The Tao of Twitter, and of course the newest book, The Content Code. The Content Code breaks down the process to truly great content into just six elements, and that makes it badass. <laughs> so why don't you explain to us what the acronym BADASS if it is an acronym, means. Yeah, it's kind of an acronym. Uh, well, you know, Janet, uh, I've been obsessed with this idea um, of we, we're, we're I, I could argue that this is the most difficult time of all to be in marketing. You know, when, when I mean, when you and I were starting out, it was pretty clear cut. You had a couple TV stations, a couple radio stations, newspaper magazines, you throw in a little PR dazzle and you're done. And now there's so much fragmentation, there's so much content, there's so many channels, and everybody and everything is fighting for the same attention. So I've been really obsessed for the last year and a half with trying to figure out what do we do about that? You know, what, what do, where does the conversation need to be? I think we're entering uh, an, an, an era where content, social media, it's, it's in this mature phase where everybody's kind of getting it and everybody's putting content out there. So what I've done is, is really focus on the idea that the, the marketing priority should be on ignition. And there's a strategic priority and an economic priority to, to really focus on not just creating content, but creating content that moves. Uh, the, the, the content doesn't do anything unless people are sharing it, recommending it, uh, and uh, you know, connecting it to their, their friends and, and beyond. And so if we look at ignition as a priority, it really suggests a whole new mindset around marketing, a whole new mindset about some of the core competencies that we need as marketers. So I discovered, I, I worked as hard as I could, I did a lot of research, I discovered there are six possible ways to move that content. And those are the six elements of the book that I go into. And about halfway through the book, I realized that if you take the first letter of each of these elements, it spells badass, which is <laughs> the, the greatest professional accomplishment I've ever had. I nearly, I nearly wept with giddy pride at what I had, what I had done. The joy of badassery. Truly, I had created a badass strategy. So that's what, that's, that's the, a lot of people are making jokes about badass on the internet. That's, that's the secret of the, of the content code. Okay. That's pretty cool. So you need to tell us what badass, what, what each of those letters means to you, or at least give us a summary and then we can get in a little deeper into that. Okay. The first one is, is branding. And what I discovered is that branding is more important than ever. That sometimes people share content for a reason that has nothing to do with the content. They share content because they love the brand. So an important concept I have in that chapter is building the heroic brand. Everybody has a personal brand, but how do we build a brand where people care about you and connect to you in such a way that they want to share this content just because they, the, 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 the connection is so deep, the trust is so strong. So the next one is A, and the A uh, is for alpha audience. So we've really been spending a lot of time talking about how do we build our audience, how do we build our followers, but if you think about the priority around building, uh, about sharing content, uh, who shares the content? And when you get into why people share content, it's mesmerizing. And when you get into the psychology of why they do it and who does it, it's so interesting. And so I realized this is an elite group of people. It may be less than 2% of your audience. And so we need to focus like a laser not just on building followers, but focusing on this elite group, this alpha audience that actually creates the business benefits for our organization. And is that alpha audience different for 
every brand, every person, and may they have more than yeah. one like segmentation well, yeah. of that group. Yeah, possibly, but absolutely. In the book, I talk about this being a proprietary audience, not in the not in the meaning that you own it, because you can't own an audience. Everybody will can leave on a moment's notice, but it's proprietary in that these people have raised their hand and said, I love you. You mean something to me. Mark it to me. And so now we have this privilege and we have this responsibility to take care of this proprietary audience. Mm -hmm. So the next uh, letter is D. And this stands for distribution, promotion, advertising, and SEO. And I thought it was important to group that all in one category because if I didn't, it wouldn't spell badass anymore. <laughs> but there's oh, other man. reasons for that too. This is the only category that really takes money. So the other five categories, one of the things I love about the book, one of the things I think that will give people hope is that um, it's not linear. It's not like you do one, then you do two, then you do three, and if you fail at three, you can't go to four. You could take a little bit out of each chapter or a little bit out of one chapter, and it will help your business, whether you're big or you're small. And most of the ideas in the book don't take any money at all. It does take effort, but you know it, it doesn't necessarily take cash flow. So, um, so distribution, advertising, and SEO, um, but I put this in a very different context because today this is the default position for many businesses. No, nothing's happening with their content. It's not moving. So what do they do? They take out ads. They you know they invest in SEO. Shove I saw it down our throats. <laughs> shove it down our throats. Now this is actually a key point because you can you can trick people into clicking a link but you can't trick them to share mm -hmm. all right so it, it, it again i'm suggesting a change in mindset about how we approach these things the economic value comes in the sharing not necessarily in the clicking it's a start that's just a start it gets you there but you know but then what once you get you know, that, in there you've got to do something with them You've got it. You've got yeah, yeah, and that and it takes a long time to build those relationships. And also, I should also add, I skipped a part when when I talk about the the uh, the chapter on on audience. There's also a segment on there about influencers, and how influencers can you know what the, both the myth of influencers and the practical reality of of influencers. Mm. Okay, so now we got now we're down to the next A, which is authority. And uh, this is the most difficult one. I mean, this is, this is the hardest one to really achieve anything, at least in the short term. And the example I use in the book is uh, uh, about a year ago, I wrote this blog post called uh, Content Shock. It was talking about the economics of content and information density, and it was a word I made up. So there was no pre-existing SEO for this. About three weeks after I wrote the article, I Googled content shock to see who might have written some articles, you know, what are they saying out there about it? And to my utter shock, my article on the Google search was third. Now, how is that possible? I wrote the article. It was the original article. <laughs> Everything's first. pointing to me. I was first. I coined the term that I just Googled, and here's what happened. The most powerful content didn't move to the top. The most powerful websites did. And so this is a very legitimate thing that we have to think about in the long term to get our content to move, to get our content to go to the top. It's not necessarily the content, and it ha might have more to do with the authority of the people who are posting the content. Mm. So it's, it's a very subtle thing, but I wanted to be complete. I wanted to cover every single thing that could, that could move content. So then we get into S. And the first S is social proof and social signals. 
So a quick example of what I mean by that is let's say you moved into a house in the suburbs and you want to plant a little garden, you want to plant roses. So you Google, how do I grow roses in San Jose, California? And so you get two blog posts. They both look really pretty cool, but one has been tweeted two times and one has been tweeted 270 times. Which one will you read? 270. Obviously, All right. Yeah. So this content has ignited only because of a number. Has nothing to do with the quality, has nothing to do with the brand, the audience, where it's posted. It's ignited because of the social proof. And this is a legitimate marketing idea that we need to think about today. Then the last S is actually the most important point in the book, I think. And it's so big, I actually devoted two chapters to it. And that is embed it, making your content more shareable and embedding shareability into what you do so you have a better chance for it to ignite so that you remove every barrier and every obstacle that you can possibly come up with to get that content to, to flow. You want to unclog the pipes. You want to give this content the best chance to get out there. So there are some very practical tips, uh, some statistically um, developed ideas and, and practices that you can implement right away mm -hmm. to get your content to start to move. And so, uh, so that's basically badass. That's badass. That is truly <laughs> badass. So let's go back a little bit to talking about authority and the value of authority. For example, you know, the, the SEO is constantly changing, right? So a website, like I have a website that was built in 1993. And so because it goes back so far, it has a lot of authority. And that's maintained through all of the different Penguin and Hummingbird and all the different updates. But I wonder now if social proof is actually outweighing that kind of web authority, that kind of heavy you know, dropping the dictionary on the desk kind of authority. Do you feel like it is kind of? <laughs> I love that image. It? I love that image. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, it's an excellent question. And one of the things I talk about in the book is uh, like moving around authority, finding a way to get around it because you're exactly right. You know, uh, a website that's been out there since the 90s that has all this accumulated content and all this accumulated authority with Google. I mean, good luck. You're just not going to beat that. However, if you look at what Google is bringing to the top these days, it's not necessarily just websites. So for example, LinkedIn as a publishing platform has become very, very powerful. And it's a way you can borrow the authority of LinkedIn to get your content to the top. Yeah. You know, a, a, another idea is to, is to become the hub yourself to attract people to you to, to say, forget about Google. You know, I'm, I'm working in an industry, let's say, you know, pharmaceutical or medical supplies or something like that. I'm going to create a hub of curated content so valuable, so amazing that people will come to me, they'll subscribe to me, I'm going to go around all that stuff. Mm. So uh, I, the, the, the chapter approaches it from two ways. Number one, what can you do to start building your own authority over time? And number two, in the short term, how do we cheat? Mm. So to speak to that, let's talk about how you can leverage that alpha audience because if you develop your alpha audience and really get people engaging with you and they are authorities such as yourself I'm leveraging you as my alpha audience right now <laughs> can you know can that help you gain that authority because like you said you can't beat a lot of these sites yeah. and you know leveraging LinkedIn is, is a really great way to do that too yeah well I think it's a very key idea and it's an idea that Surprisingly, a lot of businesses really overlook. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. Um, there are people out there telling us every day that they love us. And yet, our dashboards 
really aren't tuned to figure that out. So I'll give you an example of what I mean. Let's say that uh, there's someone out there who only tweets four or five times a month, but half of her tweets are about you. That's significant. Yeah. She's devoting half of the content that she's sharing. It's you. Now, on the type of dashboards that we typically have today, she's only going to show up as a mention. She's only going to show up as like positive sentiment. The deeper analysis of someone basically in a virtual way raising their hand saying, I believe in you. You know, I love you. I, here's another example. The other day, somebody posted a picture of me at a conference with, I think it was C.C. Chapman. And someone I had never heard of before tweeted about the picture. Those are my two favorite bloggers. Hmm. Now, I had never heard of this person before. She had never tweeted. She had never commented. But in a, in a, there's a small, strong signal there that's saying, I am your alpha audience. Mm -hmm. All right. So I've got to put her in a special place. And I've got to figure out, how is she engaging with me? How do I reinforce this? How do I reward her? Because there might only be, you know, 2%, less than 5%, let's say, of your audience who is in that category. And we need to grow that to 6% and 7%. We can't lose a single one. Mm -hmm. And so we have to look at these new techniques and that isn't in the big data. It's in the little data. There aren't any shortcuts. We're going to have to find new ways to discover these very special people and, and, and acknowledge them and reward them. Well, I couldn't agree with that more. And I, I do think that, you know, we spend so much time thinking about big data and the importance of big data, and it's really a fire hose. And getting that fire hose doesn't do you any good unless you can filter it and actually find the people that are those kind of jewels that, yeah. you know, I mean, the average blog post, you may get a thousand reads on a blog post and get two comments. Yeah. You know, it isn't always a place where people engage or you may not see the shares because they may not mention you, but they may be sharing it within their network. Right. So finding right. the ways to connect with those people and then to support them and nurture those relationships is just hugely important. Mm -hmm. So I have to ask you then, did you follow her? Yeah, of, well, of course. Did you, did you share any of her content? Well, what, I'm still figuring that out. What mm -hmm. I've done in the, in the short term is I created a special Twitter list for alpha audience. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, this is all really kind of uh, new, new thinking. And, and as, as I got into this chapter of this book, I realized I could probably write an entire book just about that. Mm. And so, uh, you know, for example, uh, Christopher Penn, who's the wonderful data scientist uh, that works for Shift Communications in Boston, uh, was inspired by what I wrote. And he wrote a blog post about tricky ways to find your alpha audience. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, there's, I think there's a very rich opportunity there if, if, we, if we can shift the, the dialogue and first shift the mindset today, we're, we're not talking about these things. No. We're, we're still talking about creating content, you know, creating content, creating better content, creating epic content, creating more efficient content, automating content, you know, and then getting more followers. And that is not creating ec economic value. That is creating zero economic value. There's no follow through. There's content, if it's not moving, if it's not igniting, you might as well just lock it in a bank vault because it's, it's not doing anything for you. And we're seeing this now. We're hearing this. We're reading about it in, in Ad Age and other publications that brands have bought in to the content marketing uh, mantra. They're creating all this content. Nothing's happening. And they're figuring out, okay, what do we do next? Well, well they, need to, they, they need to read my book, obviously. <laughs> exactly. But, that, exactly. but we, need, need, to we need to move the conversation forward and be thinking about, you know, what is driving the economics? There's only one thing. 
but it's but we're not talking about it. It's not part of the conversation yet. But doesn't it go back to the old school methodology of you know we're going to just keep hitting you with our content, our content, our content, and we really don't care if you're listening or not. It's all push marketing. They're just making more of it. Then you know it's it's the same old ad strategy that they've been using for hundreds of years. Well, Times that, you know this, this is and this is really kind of a hot button with me. Oh, good. Is that, you know, organizationally, we are contributing to the problem. Because I'll give you, you know, I'll give you an example. I was working with um, a big, huge, Fortune, probably 100 brand, and uh, they, you know, they have a big ad agency. They have a global ad agency, and this, I was working with this brand manager, and she said, "I'm so frustrated." Because every time I have an idea for a social initiative or a content-driven initiative, it comes back as advertising. Hmm. She said, I'm sick of it. I'm tired of it. I'm ready to fire this agency. And, the, and I hear this over and over again. And the, the thing is that we've got this relationship with agencies where they are, I mean, they're organized and funded on campaigns. Mm -hmm. Okay, and if you're building relationships through your content, that's not a campaign. It never stops. And, and, and it detracts from their, their mission, you know, because it, it, it dilutes what they're saying. If people have a conversation without them, we don't need them anymore. But, right. And, and we, the other thing is that, you know, part of the way we're codifying this problem, institutionalizing this problem, is because... Um, that our, our, our marketing budgets are set up this way too. We don't want to engage and we're happy to abdicate and give our alpha audience to an ad agency. Mm. And at some point we've got to stand up and say, no, you know, we are going to take care of this. It's just too important. We are going to hold on to these precious people. We're going to, you know, we are going to reward them, nurture them, and they're going to know us. They're going to know our people. We're not going to abdicate to an advertising agency, even though that's the way we've always worked. And that's certainly the most effective and efficient thing. And gosh, what am I going to do to get the headcount approved? You know, I'm sorry, but we've got to, to, to move ahead. That's what the best companies, that's what the best, best uh, marketers are starting to, to realize. Mm -hmm. Well, then that increases that level of authenticity, whether, you know, they bring, even if they bring in an engineer, for example, and let them have their say, you know, and cycling people through, it doesn't always have to be the same people that are doing the social media outreach, you know, having engagement, because I think that's something that, that corporate entities get hung up on. Well, okay, then we'll give it to marketing. Well, it's still not really the best way to do it. And a, and a lot of people, in the, I mean, my view on that is, is get people involved who are, who are passionate about it, who are interested in it, who really want to be a beacon for your company. You know, I've worked with, with companies, you know, where, where like doctors and engineers are excited about getting involved in this, in this because, you know, they get to kind of follow, you know, their passion, their communication skills. They kind of get out of their box. They, they get to personally help the marketing in the company and connect with customers, and it can be a very powerful driver. Mm -hmm, of course. So let's talk, though, about companies that, doctors, for example, that say, I don't have time to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have time to, to sit down and do that. I don't want to learn the tools. Mm -hmm. Even if they're excited about the technology and they still don't have the time, mm -hmm. how can they work around that and still be effective? Well, you know, I, I'm actually, this might surprise you, but I'm actually okay with that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, I am, you know, it, it kind of drives me crazy when people say that we need to have a social enterprise. Everybody needs to be involved. The CEO needs to be blogging and tweeting. I say bullshit. You know, I've worked in big companies and I know the pressures on these CEOs. I know the pressures on these leaders. And it, it, it's kind of like saying, oh, to be effective at internal communications, the CEO has to do your company newsletter. No, it's not, it's, you know, come on. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. It's not good for 
to them, they're going to be miserable doing it. The board of directors is going to look over and say, why are you spending your time on that? Mm. So, I mean, I, I'm very practical. I mean, I've been in business a long time. And whenever I hear people say the CEO needs to be directly involved in this stuff, I, I say, you've probably never really worked in a company before. <laughs> I mean, if, if you've got an executive who embraces that, mm -hmm. Let him do you it. know, consider it a gift, mm -hmm. consider it an asset, but don't make anybody do it. If they don't want to do it, you know, th then they're not, they're going to hate it anyway. And that's going to come through in their, in their blogging and their tweeting. It's not going to work. Yeah. We certainly so don't want you gotta, being miserable. You got, you got to figure something else out. Mm -hmm. You know, I, again, I'm not a purist about ghost writing. We've, we've done ghost writing for, you know, for decades. Whenever a, a CEO gives a speech, did they write the speech? No. Is it theirs? Yes. Mm -hmm. When a CEO writes the letter to shareholders on the first page of an annual report, did they write it? No. Is it theirs? Yes. So, uh, you know, do whatever you need to do to make it work. I don't, I'm not saying fake it. I'm not saying pretend to be somebody that you're not. But I think there are practical, cost-effective approaches to helping people out if they don't want to be involved. Mm -hmm. Well, some of the things that we suggest are interviewing, you know, because typically, you know, engineers in particular, they may be really passionate about what they do, but they may not be as great at expressing it. They may not have the time. They may not feel like, you know, they want to be that person, mm -hmm. but you can interview them mm -hmm. and then you can use that as the content that you're, you're, putting out and then when you get questions when you start to get engagement you can go back to them and talk right. to them about it and, it and and it makes them the star too you know mm -hmm. and they they feel good about it and yeah so i mean i think that's a great idea yeah so uh i like to wrap this up because i think you know we've got we got some really great stuff here and i'm very excited about the book i did Download it. It's on my Kindle, although I probably can't even open it right now. Oh, there it is, Table of Contacts. <laughs> um, and I'm really excited that you're going to be doing this as an audiobook because I really love audiobooks, and I hear you're recording it now. I am. I'm, I'm recording it uh, now. I'm about halfway through recording it. Of course, it needs to be you know processed and engineered to take all the all mm -hmm. the bad parts out. Um, but yeah, I, I've taken, I've done, um, I just finished, uh, recording, uh, my last book, social media explained that should be out in about a week or so. And then, uh, I'm guessing, um, uh, my goal is to have the content code out in audio form by the end of May. Wow. And social media explained, will that be available on audible or yes. what channels? It'll be on audible. Oh, great. Yeah. Great. So we'll look for that for sure. Yep, my first audio book. Yay. <laughs> I'm a big fan of audio books, so that, that's always good news. Yeah, well, I've had lots, lots of requests for audio books. And so I just thought, you know what, I just, I just have to do this. So, um, uh, so, yeah, it's been a fun experience. That's great. So why don't you tell people where they can find the book and where they can find you? Well, you can find everything about me at businessesgrow.com. You can find my blog, my podcast that I do with Tom Webster uh, called The Marketing Companion. It's the most hilarious marketing podcast on earth. <laughs> Great. And, um, we, uh, and you can find my books and a lot of other resources for, for businesses of all sizes. Wonderful. Well, thanks very much, Mark. I really appreciate you coming on, and I will make sure that lots of people get to see this video and they know where to get the book on Amazon from your website as yep. well. Yep. Great. Thanks, thanks very so, much. Thanks so much for having me, Janet.